Today on America's Test Kitchen, Lon and Julia make perfect omelets with cheddar and chives. Jack challenges Julia and Bridget to a head-to-head -head tasting of bottled cold brew. And Aaron makes Bridget breakfast sausage patties. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. There's one simple recipe that strikes fear into the heart of most chefs, and that's this simple omelet, because they're incredibly hard to do perfectly, which is what Lon is gonna show us how to do today. I think you're gonna have fun with this. I learned how to make these on the fly, working in omelet station. It was touch and go for the first three months. <laughs> But once you master it, it's a lot of fun to do. It used to have a scoring system. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Only the nines and higher got out of the kitchen. Oh, goodness. We're going to get you to a perfect 10 omelet today. On the first try? First try. Oh, I'm in. I'm actually really excited to see your method. So I think three large eggs uh -huh. is a perfect size for an omelet. If you have too much egg in there, it's hard to fold. And if there's not enough egg in there, it's too thin and it'll tear. So. OK, three eggs. Three eggs. I'm going to add a pinch of salt and just beat them really well. The only thing you really need to know here is that if your eggs are streaky here, your omelet's going to be streaky. Uh, I like to use a fork rather than a whisk. Why is that? I just think the fork fits better in this bowl, like the head of the whisk is too large. You can't really make use of it in a small bowl. You're beating the heck out of it. Yeah. That's more than I usually do. So right off the bat, I learned something. <laughs> Beat the heck out of your eggs? Yes. All right, next, I'm using one ounce of extra sharp cheddar. As long as it's a good melter, it'll be nice here. I'm actually gonna pre-melt this cheese. You want your filling to be at serving temp. Once it's in place, the eggs are gonna insulate it from the heat of the pan. So if it's not hot, it's not gonna be hot when you serve it. Pre-melting the cheese. I know, it sounds a little fussy, but I <laughs> swear it's worth it. This is next level, all right. We're gonna melt this cheese in the microwave at 50% power for 30 to 60 seconds. Is that good? Yes. So, melted cheese ready to go. Mm -hmm. Smells good. We're gonna start cooking. This is gonna go fast. Butter in the skillet, one and a half teaspoons of butter. I'm gonna heat this pan at medium heat. Really wanna make sure I get that heat right. When there is even bubbling across the bottom of the skillet, whole thing's hot and it's ready to go. So, eggs go in. Mm -hmm. And at this point, we're not trying to shape the eggs or do anything fancy. We're just cooking them. Okay. I want to stir constantly as I cook because that makes small curds, mm -hmm. helps the eggs cook evenly, and that's how you get a nice smooth surface to your omelet. Now that we're 80% cooked, yeah. I don't want to see a ton of liquid egg left. This looks good. Shut this off. Now, the eggs are about 90% cooked, mm -hmm. and I'm going to scrape the sides of the pan so that they're nice and clean. You can sort of mold them into your omelet shape. Yeah, that 10% of not quite cooked egg, it's the glue that holds the curds together. So you definitely need some of it to not be cooked. Okay. Just making a nice flat round shape. So I've got my cheese here and what I'm gonna do is make a two inch or so wide strip. Whatever you're filling your omelet with, you want it to cover the center of the omelet and you want to place it so that the filling is perpendicular to the handle of the pan. So we'll cover this now. There's a little bit of residual heat in there. It's going to set that raw egg that is holding the curds together. We'll just give it one minute to hang out. Okay. Using a nonstick skillet is key if you want to make a good omelet, which made me wonder how does that nonstick surface really work? When eggs cook in a traditional stainless steel skillet, the heat causes the protein in the eggs to bond to the iron atoms in the metal. As the eggs cook, the more proteins uncoil, exposing more of their surface, making them stick even more. A nonstick pan, however, has a coating on top of the metal made of polytetrafluoroethylene, or PTFE, commonly known as Teflon. It's an incredibly slippery polymer made of long chains of carbon atoms tightly bound to fluorine atoms. The bond between carbon and fluorine is so strong that the atoms can't bond to anything else, like eggs. And that's why eggs will slide right out of a nonstick skillet. So this last part is my favorite part of <laughs> omelet making. I refer to it as the dismount. You ready? I am ready. Here we go. First, I'm gonna loosen these eggs just to make sure they're not stuck anywhere. And then I'll scoot them down. And I'm looking for the edge of the omelet to hit the edge of the skillet. Now I'm going to fold this top third over the filling. I'm going to switch my grip. 
I want an underhand grip. And what we're gonna do is kind of, have you ever pulled a beer? Yes. That's the motion we're going for. We're just gonna roll it right out of the pan onto a plate. Oh, gorgeous. You stuck the landing. I feel like I could have gotten it a little bit smoother over here, wow. but I'm not gonna stress it. All right, I'm gonna get this into a low oven so it stays warm and you can hold this for about 10 minutes. All right, Julia, show me what you got. <laughs> yes, chef. Three eggs, mm -hmm. pinch of salt, yep. whisking the heck out of it. Yep. See, at home, this is where I'd stop. No, I want a 10. Yep. This will make the folding so much easier. It's worth it. Okay. I think that looks pretty good. What do you yeah. think? Good. All right, next we're gonna melt the cheese. Mm -hmm. Now it took about 40 or so seconds at 50% power. You're eagle-eyed. <laughs> I was really paying attention. You really were. <laughs> Cheese is melted, except for that little bit. That's okay? That's okay. That plate is warm. It's gonna keep doing its thing while you're okay. cooking. Okay. If that gets me less than a 10, I'll be mad. One and a half teaspoons of unsalted butter. Medium heat, evenly hot pan, the bubbles all the way around. Mm -hmm. All right, in go to the eggs. And now cook and stir. We want little curds. Stir harder. Oh, keep oh going. no story time. No, no story keep going. time. <laughs> Otherwise your liquid egg sits on top and it's not cooking. Gotcha. Yeah, there you go. So that's the crucial moment right yeah, there. Yeah, you just got to keep going. Okay. Shut off the heat now. Shut off the heat now. Smooth All right. it out. You just want to smooth it into an even layer. Smooth, smooth, smooth. Oh. Don't worry, the heat's off at this point. Okay, should so, I take it off the hot burner? On electric, I would definitely move since we're on gas and it's so responsive. I think this is fine. Okay. Next, the cheese. Yep. We're looking for about a two inch wide strip perpendicular to the handle. Lid on. Lid on one minute. Take a deep breath. <laughs> you made it. I made it here, but I haven't done the dismount. Here we go. It's been a minute. Tidy up the edges. Make sure it's not sticking. Make sure it's not sticking. And then push and shimmy it down towards the edge. There you go. Okay. You got to do it with confidence. Just go. Just mm -hmm. hold your breath and just, oh, you almost had it. I almost had it. That's actually not bad, Julia. For my first omelet? Yeah. Edible? Absolutely. Not a 10. Oh, that's like maybe five. No, I think you've got great shape. The cook looks perfect. It's not going to be runny. Well, Julia Child always said, just put some parsley on it. Right. In this case, maybe some chives. A little bit of chive. I'm excited to eat this. I'm going right for the center. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Because that's how you tell a good omelet. The cheese is melted and the eggs aren't runny. Oh, look at that. Yes. Yes, cheese. Mmm. A good cheese omelet really is more than the sum of its parts. I actually do this for breakfast pretty often. It's so fast. If you can get this done in, what, six minutes? Not even. Yeah. Lon, thank you for teaching. That was fun. That was fun. So if you want to get a 10 from Lon when making an omelet, use three eggs and whisk them good, pre-melt the cheese filling, and let the omelet finish cooking off the heat. From America's Test Kitchen, a foolproof recipe for an omelet with cheddar and chives. At America's Test Kitchen, recipe development is serious business. Head over to americastestkitchen.com and unlock 14,000 expert developed recipes and 8,000 unbiased product reviews, all rigorously tested by our team. Access every episode of every season of your favorite cooking shows. That's 38 seasons of inspiration. And with the ATK Members app, you'll have 30 years of expertise at your fingertips anywhere, anytime. Join us and become a smarter cook. Start your free all-access trial membership at americastestkitchen.com today. Cold brew coffee is all the rage in trendy shops. You can make it yourself if you have 24 hours, or you can go to the supermarket and buy it. That's what I've got here for both of you. Cold brew. Hope you're ready to be caffeinated. Yeah. <laughs> so dig in. I've got four samples here. Okay. Three different styles. From concentrate, where you then reconstitute yourself with more water, ready to drink, and then New Orleans style with chicory. Mm, okay. Right. So cold brew, and the reason why it's gotten so popular is because of the way it's made, it's less acidic, less harsh. Mm. So traditionally, you guys know, you brew coffee eight minutes, 195 to 205 degree water to quickly extract all of the compounds. Cold brew uses room temperature water and it takes time, at least 10 hours, often 24 hours, and you don't get a lot of those harsh notes. And so for people who really like coffee but not the acidity, cold brew is their friend. So 
as you guys are sampling, we did this two ways. We did this black, the way you're going to taste them. I'm going to give you an option later after you've fessed up about your favorites. Oh, wow, she's a strong one. Mm. I'm going to give you a chance to have some milk <laughs> later, but I, I want you to put milk in these usually. All right, well, I want you to taste them plain because it really will change your perception oh. when you put the milk in. Right, I bet. But I want you to be on a level playing field because I know you're in the no milk camp. Well, I drink hot coffee. And I like, I, I'm more of a quantity girl than a quality girl. <laughs> I like hot conference room coffee. <laughs> By the urn. <laughs> Just wake me up, that's all I ask. So the New Orleans style, they're made with chicory, which is a way to sort of reduce acidity already, but they also have other flavorings in them. So spices, a little bit of citrus, notes of cinnamon in some of the New Orleans style. And that was really, some tasters liked it and some were like, don't put cinnamon in my coffee. Right. So any initial impressions, who wants to jump in first? I like A and B, they're very smooth. There's no strong flavors. They're on the watery side and I love watery coffee. It is my jam. I know there's very few people like, who likes weak coffee? That's me. These two, too strong for me. One of these must have chicory in it because it was a really strong woodsy flavor that I didn't like. Okay, and anything that you'd like to comment on? Yeah, I mean, similar. These, I prefer A over the rest of them, A and B. My favorite, this one is quite tannic. Mm -hmm. I think there's some sourness going on there. This one seems to have some sort of warm spice thing going on. So it sounds like A and B, you guys are pretty much in agreement, and yep. C and D, not so much. Not, not so, so much. much. I will tell you that D is the New Orleans style. So you mm -hmm. both were picking up the spice notes. It's from a company named Grady's. And again, people who liked those spice notes or citrus notes, great. Other people, not so much. The Grady's was our favorite of the New Orleans style. Okay. So it only brought winners. For letter C, Chameleon was our favorite from Concentrate. B is Starbucks. A was from La Colombe. And one was our favorite with milk, and one was our favorite oh, plain. So maybe, since you're the Miss Milk, yeah. <laughs> or, you know, I don't know, you're just gonna sip, keep on sipping because I know you don't really love milk. But we felt like the flavor really changed when we tried all of them with milk, but things that seemed too strong, like C, which you guys thought was awfully intense and tannic, is gonna be much better with milk. And so that was really a big factor in the large tasting where we offered folks both the ability to taste it plain and with milk. So Lachlan was our favorite when it was plain because it was kind of rounded and felt nice. The Starbucks gets better with the milk because it was kind of intense and mm. the milk kind of softens the rough yeah. edges. Brings out the chocolatiness. Yeah, no, this is ultimately very drinkable. B. <laughs> It's potable. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> very drinkable. All right, so you both like A, the La Colombe, the taster's favorite choice when it was plain. You both like B, this is the taster's favorite choice with milk from Starbucks. You weren't that wild about C, the Chameleon, which was our favorite concentrate, and you weren't that wild about D, the Grady's, which was our favorite with chicory. You decided milk isn't so bad. <laughs> you confirmed that you have to drink cold brew coffee with milk. There you have it. Cold brew coffee, something for everyone. Are you ready to take your cooking to the next level? Introducing the complete America's Test Kitchen TV show cookbook. Featuring every recipe from every episode of America's Test Kitchen. That's thousands of recipes. That texture is unbelievable. Reviews. Gadgets you didn't know you needed. And tips. Yes, there's some terrible choices, but there are also some amazing choices. <laughs> <laughs> We've spilled all of our secrets and included our insider notes alongside each recipe. Plus, there's a handy shopping guide so you know exactly what to grab when you're at the store. And of course, it makes an excellent gift. Get your copy today at americastestkitchen.com. Now, I'm paraphrasing here, but there's an old saying that goes, anyone who loves the law or sausages should never see either being made. And I would agree a little bit. I think that's only half true. You should definitely know how sausage is made because you can control what goes into it. And who better to teach us the fundamentals than Erin? Yes, Bridget, I'm gonna teach you how to make breakfast sausage patties, but more importantly, I'm gonna teach you the fundamentals of making sausage right. and what the perfect formula is. And so then you can make any type of sausage you want once you have that formula down. It's the sausage house rules. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> We're making breakfast sausage patties. So let's start with our seasoning mix. One tablespoon of light brown sugar, mm -hmm. two teaspoons of rubbed sage. That is essential to breakfast sausage. Absolutely. Yes. A teaspoon of ground black pepper. Okay. And a quarter teaspoon of cayenne. Ooh, a little spicy. A little kick. 
So all you have to do is just kind of mix this together. All right. And now onto the pork. We are using a two pound piece of pork butt. Pork butt is very important because it has a perfect ratio of meat and fat. And fat is very important in your sausage. Okay. So typical sausage has about 20 to 30% fat. And pork butt typically has about 20% fat. Oh, okay. Which includes the fat cap and also marbling. So when you choose your pork butt, you wanna make sure that you choose one that has a full fat cap and that also has really nice marbling. So I have one pound of pork butt for you and one pound of pork butt for me in total, two pounds. We're gonna cut this into three quarter inch pieces. And as we go, we're gonna trim out any connective tissue or sinew that we come across. But okay. don't trim out the fat because the fat's important. You know who you're talking to. Am I ever gonna yeah. throw away the fat? Absolutely not. I trust you. Okay. This is gorgeous pork. I really did not need to trim away much at all. So this is a star ingredient, but there's another ingredient that is very important, is critical, and that is salt. Typically, sausage has between one and a half to two percent of the weight of the pork in salt. Okay. All right. And so we actually tried using one and a half percent, one and three quarter percent, and two percent. And we tasted them side by side, and we really landed on going with one and a half percent as being the best. So in order to figure that out, we need to weigh our pork. We're not going to use ounces. We're going to use grams here. So here we have 962 grams. So I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna multiply that by 0 0.015, 14.43. So we're gonna round to 14. Okay. Right, so we need 14 grams of salt. Because we're using the weight and not the volume, we can use a table or kosher salt. And I have table salt here, so we want 14 grams of table salt. We've got all of these formulas, all of the ratios on our website, mm -hmm. so. So I'm just gonna add the salt to the pork and I'm gonna take our breakfast seasoning mix from earlier and I'm just gonna to toss it all in order for the salt to be effective. So we're just gonna cover this, let it sit with the salt mixture on it for at least eight hours and up to two days. All right, Bridget, our pork has been refrigerated for eight hours. Okay. I'm gonna take our pork and transfer it to a rim baking sheet, evenly space out the pieces. You can see how it's already firmed up. That eight hours is very important and you can tell that the salt is like, has already started working on this. The salt seasons the meat, it wards off harmful microbes, it restructures the proteins, which is gonna allow it to hold on to its juices mm. when it's cooking. It's gonna dissolve the myosin, which is a protein in pork that is gonna give it that glue that binds the sausage together and gives it that nice snap. Gotcha, it's okay. the sticky stuff. Yes. Now, when you grind the meat, it creates friction, and the heat is going to soften our fat and also our meat. So we're gonna freeze the tray of meat for about 35 to 55 minutes until it's very stiff on the outside and very pliable on the inside. All right. And we're also gonna freeze our grinding attachments. Bridget, our pork has been in the freezer for 45 minutes. The edges are nice and firm, but it's also very pliable. And we also froze our grinder attachment for about an hour. Everything's cold, including our bowls that we're gonna catch <laughs> the ground pork. So I have a large bowl filled with ice and I have a medium bowl inserted in it. So as I grind it, it's gonna fall into this chilled bowl and it's gonna stay cold. Everything is cold. Everything's cold. So we're gonna make a coarse ground sausage. So I'm using a die that is three sixteenths of an inch to a quarter of an inch. That's very important. All right, we're ready to grind. I'm gonna turn this to medium. And I'm gonna start feeding the pork in. If you don't have a meat grinder, you can use a food processor. So you just want to go to our website for the instructions. Great. Right. Can you see the distinct meat to I fat? Sure can. Yeah. So satisfying. It really is. The very simple steps that really make a difference. This stuff looks great. There's really no grizzle in this, Bridget. And it's firm. I can feel it. And it's just very, very cold. Well, the next step is I'm going to need this bowl, Bridget. So can you dump the ice out and yep. dry it for me, please? Okay. All right, here you go. It's still really cold. Which is good. Okay. Right? Following the theme. Yes. Temperature. All right, so the next step is I'm gonna just transfer this to the larger bowl. So I'm gonna knead it for about one and a half to two minutes. Okay. And I really wanted to encourage that myosin to kind of continue to break down. And you're gonna see that the size of the bowl is gonna be nice and tacky. And you're gonna see this kind of transform. And what that's gonna do is give our sausage that snap that we're looking for. All right. All right. And what I'm doing here is very similar to what you do when making bread, where you need the dough to develop the gluten, which is gonna give the texture that you're looking for. And what we're doing here is we're kneading the meat to bring out the myosin. Right, right? so give us that nice snappy texture. Yes. I am 
pretty darn happy with this, Bridget. The myosin has been worked out, and you can see it on the sides of the bowl. Yes. The meat itself is still very, very, very chilled, and I think we're ready for the next step. As I weigh into portions, I want you to shape it into a two and a half inch wide, half inch thick patty. This is gonna make about 16 sausage patties, between one and a half to two ounces each. Sausage number one. All right. How cold is that? It's pretty chilled. Yeah. How's that look? That's beautiful. That's gorgeous. All right, Bridget, so we're just gonna finish forming these and then we're gonna get cooking. Okay, so Bridget, I have a 12 inch nonstick skillet heating up here over medium heat. I have two teaspoons of oil in there. Okay. It's hot, I can see it starting to shimmer. So we're gonna cook half of the patties at once. I like to start at the handle and then go in a circular motion so that I can keep track of which one I fired first. Don't look at me like that. No, no. <laughs> Us being more like you would be a very good thing. Oh, that's funny. So we're gonna cook these for about three to five minutes. I want it to be nice and brown. So it's gonna allow some of that fat to render, but it's not gonna get it too browned on the outside before the interior. Exactly, is yep. All right, to prove my point, you can see that this is the first one I put in. You can see that that one's further along than the others. Right? Exactly, yeah. Just one starting to change color around the edges. Absolutely, yes. Okay, so now I'm just gonna check the bottom and check that out. Mm. Nice and gorgeous golden brown. I'm just gonna note that I have two spatulas here. The first one I picked up the raw sausage with, put them in there. This is for the cooked parts. So I'm just getting under the sausage and flipping it over. Mm. All right, you, you don't want cross-contamination. You always wanna cook safely. So we're gonna cook these for another three to five minutes on the second side until it's nice and golden brown. And again, we're cooking this to an internal temperature of 145 to 150. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm just gonna start taking temperatures. Again, starting with the one that I put in the pan first. And we have nailed it, 146, Bridget. If any of them are not done, then we'll just kind of like pull them out of the pan last. Okay. All right, and you know what, they're all done. Perfect. So using my spatula. <gasps> Mm. All right, we're gonna cover these with foil, keep them hot, and we're gonna cook the second batch, and then we can eat. At Cooks Illustrated, we're food nerds. That's why every recipe we develop involves research, cooking science, and rigorous testing by our team of expert test cooks, before being tested by our dedicated community of 40,000 home cooks. Only the highest rated recipes earn a place in our award-winning magazine. Every issue features our latest recipes and discoveries, cooking tips, and equipment and ingredient reviews. Our step-by-step -step photos and hand-drawn illustrations show you exactly how to succeed. What you won't see, even a single page of advertising. We've worked for home cooks like you for over 30 years. So, are you ready to become the best cook you know? Subscribe to Cooks Illustrated Magazine at cooksillustrated.com today. Bridget, it is time to eat. It's yes. breakfast time. Are you ready? I'm so ready. Okay. The whole kitchen is filled with the beautiful aroma yep. of pork and spice. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh. So, would you like one? I would like multiples of one. Multiples of one. Yes. All right, Bridget. Very tender. Mm -hmm. But it does have that little bit of snap there. And it has that, that glue, oh. the myosin that bound all the meat. Mmm. Mm-hmm. Mmm. It's like a burst of flavor it and really juices. Is. Oh, so juicy. I mean, look at mm -hmm. how little fat is on the plate. Mm -hmm. That's because it's still in here, mm -hmm. all those meat juices. They're perfectly seasoned. Absolutely, not too salty at all. Mm -hmm. Beautifully balanced spices. Now, is the breakfast sausage the only kind that we have? Now that you have the formula, you can make any type of sausage that you want. Pork, lamb, beef. We have a couple more recipes and you can find those on our website. Great. Erin, you proved precision is the path to perfect patties. Ooh, I love that. <laughs> Did you see how simple it was to make gorgeous breakfast sausage patties? Well, you can make them at home too. And it starts with Aaron's Sausage House rules. First, use the right amount of salt to pork and weigh out both ingredients. Number two, keep everything cold. Par-freeze the pork and freeze the attachments for your grinder. And finally, knead that mixture to give the sausages a snappy texture. And a few minutes in the pan is all that stands between you and sausage nirvana. So from America's Test Kitchen, the ultimate, the easy, breakfast sausage patties. And you can get this great recipe and all the recipes from this season along with product reviews and select episodes. That's all on our website, americastestkitchen.com slash TV.
We hope you enjoyed this video as much as we enjoyed making it. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. And if you're ready to take your cooking to the next level, head over to americastestkitchen.com and get a free all-access trial membership. While you're there, you can sign up for our free email newsletters and download our app. With unlimited access to over 14,000 of our Test Kitchen recipes and 8,000 product reviews, you'll have everything you need to cook and learn. So I asked, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Let's make something great together.